Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by actor, writer, director, producer, stand-up comedian, and self-development expert, Michael Stein. Michael is also the host of the Long Shot Leaders podcast. Ever since the age of 19, Michael has been an entrepreneur. He was the number one young nightclub promoter in the city of Los Angeles. So we're going to be talking to him about his life and everything that he's doing. Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. Curtis, what a voice you have. That is, that, that's smooth. I, I'm just listening to that. I can, I can go for a glass of wine right now and some light lit candles and just listen to you all night. I love it. I love your voice. You should do voiceover. I'm actually trying to break into it on the play to pay to play sites and I'm a radio DJ as well. <laughs> I love it. Sounds great. All right. What can I tell you about myself? Uh, well, you are correct. Yes. I do a, a, a podcast called long shot leaders. Uh, we tell the story as of, uh, you know, uh, underdogs who have found success, you know, people that overcome large obstacles. And, and the reason why I do a podcast like that is my backstory is, uh, I consider myself coming from a long line of uh, underdogs. My grandmother escaped the Russian concentration camps on her way to America. My dad was a New York homeless street kid, became a multimillionaire only to be a homeless person again. And uh, I myself was an unplanned child, premature, health issues, ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, put in a special needs, you know, for about a year, you know, for special needs school at UCLA for an old school. And uh, when I was in third grade and then a, uh, Came back out of that and then uh, really didn't have much success other than making people laugh and laugh at me until the, my second bit of success, like most young boys in this country, uh, saw the movie Rocky when I was 11 years old. And I said, you know, here's a guy like me. He's funny, he constantly fails, keeps on trying. But the only difference between Rocky and myself was that he was physically fit. So I decided to become, that was my thing. I was going to be physically fit and every day. And then I turned 16, I became a physical fitness trainer. And then I said, well, if I could do those two things, make people laugh and, you know, be physically fit and then I'm going to do, I'm going to become an entrepreneur and an actor and a stand-up comedian. That's what I wanted to do. And my high school teacher said, well, why don't you work with your hands? Because not everybody's meant to do what they want to do. So then I said, okay, well, I'm not going to listen to her. And then I decided to uh, start a business the day after high school, filled miserably. So I started to see this ebb and flow of failure and success, you know, early on. Uh, in my, my career. And that's why I do a podcast called Longshot Leaders because eventually I, I decided, okay, a month after I failed, I, I, I said, I'm going to do stand-up comedy. You know, finally, I was 19 years old. Started that and I packed the house and I said, well, if I could do this with comedy, I could do this with nightclubs. I came with the number one nightclub promoter in Los Angeles, uh, my age bracket, you know. From there, it started a trajectory of acting, which my first acting role was playing Dirt Diggler in the Dirt Diggler story, which became the movie Boogie Nights, which I appear in as well. And became a filmmaker and I'd had an ebb and flow of success and failure from there too. And until finally I almost got a movie deal and I was flat out broke and decided to start a business uh, to pay for a movie. Uh, within six months, I made a half a million dollars for that business. I was able to make a movie with Faye Dunaway, Andy Dick and Coolio. Found myself uh, writing, directing, acting across a two-time Academy Award winner. And, and then finally decided, you know what, I'm going to keep this business that made this film and and uh, since that business has made over $100 million, and I decided to do a podcast one day, say about talks about underdogs, people that have found success. And that's why I'm here with you today. So you've went through a lot of failure and success in your lifetime. What is your top 10 recipe for success? Well, the first thing is to know who you are and why you do and do what you do. If I was like, you know, talking to the young me, I would go back and I would say, you know, I would do an inventory. Uh, you know, I would tell you to talk to that kid and say, do an inventory of yourself. What do you want? And what, what do you, what are your likes and dislikes as, as a, you know, have you grown to? And then I would 
start to really, you know, find out what your overall goal is, you know, to get clear. The goals are supposed to be specific, right? Smart, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. So get clarity on who you are, what you want, the who, what, where, why, when, and how. Then I would say, learn how to control your emotions, which is there's the triad of emotions, right? Your physiology, your focus, and your words. I would say, you know, what does that mean? That means like, well, we find ourselves in failing situations and you're constantly, if you're, you got to learn how to be an athlete when you fail, you know? So there's always a, a system, you know, if people usually inherently when they fail is they go over the failure and they do an incantation where they can't do something because they keep on going over and saying, I failed at this. I'm no good at this. Why did that happen? And those are non-powering questions. They don't empower you in the right direction. So I get your physiology straight. You know, there's a recipe for that. Stand up straight, deep breaths, get some oxygen in your body, chin up, you know, get your physiology. Then right away, your focus, you know, what you're focusing on, you know, is it going in the direction you want to go in? Your words, mind your words and your questions. Ask yourself empowering questions for the circumstance and say, look, my car broke down. I'm going to miss the party. I'm not going to be able to get that movie deal because the director is there and da, 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 or the producer. Well, what's great about this? What's funny about this? What can you learn from this? There was something funny about it. What can you, you know, what can you write about this? Anything that's empowering. So I would start to, you know, those are the keys to success, the beginning stages of understanding yourself and, and getting your body and your mind and your, you know, how you tick. Uh, it's a lot of psychology involved. We can go on a lot longer than this, but I would, that, that's the first place that I would start, you know, in that, that direction. Speaking of psychology. You have a phrase called human needs psychology. Tell us what that means and also talk about your personal development background. Okay. Well, I'll start with the personal development, the latter. Uh, I started personal development um, right around when I started promoting nightclubs when I was 20 years old. 1990, Tony Robbins, he just came out with that cassette tape thing, you know, and I I took to it. And I've pretty much ever since done everything that Tony Robbins has ever done or Wayne Dwyer. And, um, NLP, no linguistic programming. So I have a, a big background in personal development. Uh, and six human need psychology, to be specific, or, is a theory. It's not a exact science, but it's almost a perfect art form where people do things for six need, six reasons. Certainty, uncertainty, growth, uh, significance, uh, love, growth, and contribution. So, you know, certainty is, is, a, is a survival need. Uncertainty is a variety need. Significance is to make us feel important. That's a need. That's a healthy need. Uh, love, growth, and contribution, the higher consciousness needs. You know, once I started to understand that, you know, and you could ask yourself, well, what about that? Or what about this? And all roads kind of lead to these needs, you know? And it's not just Tony Robbins or Chloe Madonna's who kind of, you know, got narrowed it down to six human needs. Human need psychology has been around, I think, since really the 30s. I forgot the, I forgot the name of the person who, uh, invented the theory of human need psychology, but her like kind of, you know, theorized it, but basically there's negative vehicles and positive vehicles on how you could attain those emotions. Right. So, you know, mother Teresa, she decided I'm going to have my cause celeb and my uh, reason why I'm going towards this, these to make me feel significant is to be, to contribute and they're intertwining with each other. Uh, another person say, well, why do people join gangs? Well, maybe because, you know, they're going to get a lot of the human needs met, you know, they're going to feel significant because now they're with a gang. They're going to feel certainty because they feel security because now they're protected. They're going to feel connection with brotherhood. They're going to feel a love, you know, an actual love. And what they know is love because they're not getting at home and that's why they're in a gang, you know? So you get these needs met, you get four out of the six, you're going to have a good day, you know, whether it's a negative vehicle or a positive vehicle, what you want to try to do is have uh, your human needs met with a positive vehicle, which is. Well, I, I uh, another personal development thing is, per, uh, you know, if it, what's a good decision, right? It's a triad of a good decision. If it's good for me and it's good for you and it's good for the greater good, chances are that's a good decision. The tough decisions are, you know, like politicians that have to say, okay, it's good for me. It's good for you. It's good for the greater good of the country, but it's not good for the greater good of the other country. Those are the hierarchy, you know, decisions. But most day to day, you know, on a one-on-one basis, we can come up with a good decision and that's kind of like the basis of human need psychology in a reader's digest form. As a child, you had health issues like ADHD, dyslexia, among other things. 
how were you able to overcome those? Slowly but surely. Um, I, uh, you know, dyslexia, I had a form of dyslexia. And I, when I was a kid, they took me to a specialist called, his name was Dr. Getz. He was in the Los Angeles area. We did a lot of uh, exercises. You know, it's something that you learn to kind of live with. It doesn't fully go away, but there's are, there are exercises. That's technically one thing that I did. As far as ADD, I don't know. I had ADHD. I just, they didn't know how, they didn't have a phrase for it. You know, when I went to school in the late seventies, you know, I just, just was a thing, you know, that like some, this kid's got, you know, he's hyper when he's supposed to be calm. He doesn't speak up when he's supposed to be energetic. You know, uh, he says inappropriate things, uh, you know, sometimes just blurt things out, very impulsive to really overcome them. It was you know, a lot of trial, a lot of failure, just a lot of mistakes. And the, the want to do certain things and, you know, to, to be successful at one thing, then I said, okay, and when then you're successful at the second thing, you, you try to be successful at the third thing. And every time you strive for something, you have to go through a learning process. And that learning process, wanting to be an actor, a filmmaker, an entrepreneur, it forced me to study, to apply, to try to win. And through pushing myself because it was hard for me to go to school. I had to be self-taught at my own pace and I had to constantly push forward to that. And a person, you know, some people can go to school and they can attain, retain the knowledge they have. Me, it's an everyday thing. We've been talking to you today, right now on this podcast, you know, regurgitating some of the, the content that we're talking about puts it back in my nervous system and keeps me uh, on point. So it's a slow but gradual process, but time plus effort plus adjustments equals eventual probable success. And that's the best way I can explain that. Well, talk about how your experience in the film industry helped you create a company unrelated to the film industry or Hollywood. Yeah. So, you know, I was not, when I wanted to be an actor and, and a filmmaker, but I was, I, I couldn't write well. I was still a poor student. I barely graduated, you know, and I was a nightclub promoter. And a nightclub promotion, you don't really need to do much writing. You're just talking to thousands of people every night. So I'm, I'm learning about human intellect on a, on a fast track basis, but I really wasn't a good writer. But um, it, pain, what happened as I said, I wrote something, somebody, a, a letter to somebody in the film industry. And they, they told the, another person, they said, Look, this, this dude, the syntax, the punctuation, the, the spell, it's terrible. This guy, you know, and it just hurt me so bad that I, you know, and, and even the vocabulary, you know, I, so I just immersed myself with, you know, books on tape and, and content and just the drive to want to do that so badly. So I studied it and I studied those things until eventually when I was a filmmaker, I, I, I prepared so much and, and immersed myself. I, I made an award-winning short film. And because of that hyper, well, the good thing about being an ADHD, you got that hyper-focus, right? So then I was able to go through those hills and valleys of that stuff and really push myself. So even though the film career, you know, it did well, it almost got me a movie deal and I, I won many awards from anything, but monetarily I had to go to something else, you know, which was this business. So by the time I hit the business, and I went through so much failure and so much journey to try to exceed, excel at something else. The creativity level, the writing, the content that you have to put in my particular business, I sell widget. So I had to like build a website. I had to, you know, it's easier to build a website than it is to write a screenplay. So writing content for a website is much easier than writing content for a screenplay. So it helped me greatly by going through all those things everything was intertwined, you know, and um, everything you learn along the way can apply towards the next thing. So I, I liken that and that, that question that you just talked about and say, you know, it's kind of like Zig Ziglar, a uh, great personal development person. Anybody doesn't know. He has this analogy where you pump the pump, a water pump, those old school water pumps, you know, and the water keeps on going up that big pipe underground. You keep on pumping and pumping and pumping and the water almost goes over to the top and starts overflowing. But some people give up and the water just goes back down. Well, sometimes, you know, you build up that and then you jump into the next thing because the first thing wasn't working, but you've been pumping all that long, all that time. All that is built up. All that's, that's credit. 
That's, that's uh, knowledge that you have that can carry over to the next venture. And so none of these things are a waste of time. They actually exponentially help the next thing. And that's how film career actually helped me in my entrepreneurial career. This next question is a two-part question. Tell us about the film that you work with Coolio in and what that was like. And also talk about your favorite film to be in in Hollywood or maybe your favorite actor or director that you work with. Okay. Well, I did this movie, um, Love Hollywood Style, start off with that. Um, I, before that, the reason why I did it, I did an award-winning short film called Rituals and Resolutions, got bought by HBO, almost got me a movie deal, met everybody in Hollywood. And after a couple of years, there was no movie deal. And I was so frustrated. So I said, screw it. I'm going to make my own movie. Only problem is I wasn't on iClub promoting anymore. I earned all my money on this film, which did well, but just no movie deal. So I was broke and in debt. I said, but I'm going to make my own movie. So I said, I'm going to just become an entrepreneur again. So I became an entrepreneur and started this business, uh, online business. It had nothing to do with you know Hollywood. And I made that money that I told you about. And I was able to make this film, Love Hollywood Style, which was a film that no one would ever let me make. It was uh, an outrageous comedy mixed in with drama. And it had four intertwining stories. And I knew I can get the talent for one day, one day for this person or that person. So I was able to get Faye Dunaway to play God because I knew I only needed to shoot her for one day. I knew I can get Coolio for one day because we had a mutual friend. He was working on a set and I said, I'll just go by there and gorilla, you know, a, a crew over there to hijack him on his lunch at break and do the whole thing right there for an hour and a half. And I got, was able to get that. And Andy Dick just needed him for one day. So that was the beauty of doing this intertwining story. So my experience on Love Hollywood style was fantastic. It was, uh, you know, to, to, I, I was the one that got to act with Faye Dunaway, two time Academy, Academy Award winner actress. And that was like phenomenal. And uh, that was uh, what Love Hollywood style is all about. And that's why Coolio, he, he was, he was, his part was playing himself. And he was talking about the rise and fall of a rap star named Montel Meshuggah, who is a symbol for civil rights, because that's when like rapper, you know, they were talking about where's the rapper from and is he, is he, is he hard? And, and I, this was a whole play on, on how this guy wasn't hard. You know, he was, a, he was also a cultural phenomenon. He was a mixture of, cause there's a, you know, at the time rap was so caught up in like race, you know, like a, this is the you know, a white rapper, a black rapper. And to me, I always thought those lines, you know, were silly. So Montel Michigan, was a symbol for civil rights. It was a very over-the-top comedy vignette, a part of the movie to where he was a black, white, African-American, Jewish, you know, rap star named Montel Michigan. And he goes through this whole typical tour de France, you know, story in uh, like a behind the music. And, and he, and narrating this is uh, Coolio talking about how great Montel was in the heyday. And Montel goes through this whole crazy life story. And there's a, there's a, there's a, like a twilight zone, funny thing at the end with Montel that kind of poetically tells his story and, and what, you know, love Hollywood style and how, you know, everybody at the end of these, these vignettes shows how dysfunctional Hollywood is and how love can be crazy and dysfunctional and how it's buttoned up at the end with, with uh, something that's, you know, a new equilibrium of, of, of uh, understanding of higher consciousness of what that, that, uh, that, crazy story was about that that each one of those things were about and coolio was the catalyst uh guest uh talking about montel kind of like a behind the music-esque kind of thing that was coolio's part in love hollywood style and as far as my favorite director uh that i've overworked it well the best director i worked with is you know my friend who you know put me in uh book at nights and uh the dirt diggler story is paul thomas anderson that's by far the greatest director i've ever worked with um, I've worked with other great directors, um, Bill Juano and, and Joel Schumacher, and, and uh, uh, I've met a lot of other directors, but I think that uh, Paul Thomas Anderson is uh, the best one I've ever worked with. One of my favorite directors is uh, Quentin Tarantino and Steven Spielberg and Martin Scorsese. Uh, I think those guys are super great. Uh, Tarantino to me is just uh, so awesome, so different. And um, those are my favorites. 
what advice would you give somebody who wants to run a, and have a sustainable, successful business? Well, p- prepare, prepare, prepare. 95% of success is preparation, right? So prepare as much as you can stomach. But most importantly, you know, once you've analyzed and done the, you know, vetted it out and what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, where you're going to do it, why you're going to do it, the who, what, where, why, when, and how, once you've done that and you have been preparing, you have to set a goal date of launch. I'm really big on dates and you, you have to just, you know, set that date and set yourself up for a win. Make sure it's attainable. You set that date, a smart goal. Once again, smart, you know, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant time. So set that date and then work backwards. Make sure that it, you have more than enough time to reach that date and be clear and, and, and prepare. And there's, those are simple things, but those are things that people skip sometimes. And that's why they fail. They get lazy or, you know, sometimes there's that preparer person, that person that constantly prepares and then they don't execute. So you got to really, you know, there's people that sleep on, sleep on it. Say, well, I'm going to do that, you know, but I haven't done it. Well, the best way to start is do immediately, immediate action, whether you say, I want to start a a business. Well, do something after you, you write down your initial idea, do something immediately because immediate action is what causes your your brain to start that motion. And then it, when you stop doing that thing that you've already started, if you build up a pattern of working towards that goal, you're, when, if you do stop, your brain says, well, wait, got to keep on doing this because if you stop, that'll be cognitive dissidence. So you want to get in a pattern of, of going for that goal. And um, so I would say prepare, set a goal date, Make sure it's attainable beyond more than attainable and then attack preparing uh, towards that goal date. Uh, take immediate action though. Uh, you know, the moment you decide you're going to go after this goal uh, and then um, do not skip that. You know, you, you enter in whether you're going to fall fat and flat in your face or not, you have to enter in the game when you said you're going to enter into it regardless. And that's, that's, that's how I would tell people that's the bones of uh, getting ready to, you know, start a business. Tell us about any upcoming projects that you might be working on that people need to know about. Okay. Uh, I am doing a documentary uh, called Burning the Boats. Uh, We just found the footage of that crazy film of Hollywood style. So we're doing a documentary on that film about, uh, you know, the question between passion and opportunity. Uh, You know, we're going to get together with, uh, Robert Rodriguez, who uh, was, did a movie called El Mariachi, and uh, he's the person that's famous for you know giving blood and doing the movie El Mariachi for six thousand dollars and uh, everything. And so we're we're going to be doing that uh, documentary called Burning the Boats. The the podcast that I do right now is uh, longshotleaders.com, and we're, we just launched that in March. We are searching for people that have long shot stories. Anybody that out there that has overcome large obstacles to find success. Those are the people we want to talk to and have on that show. And that, and uh, I promised uh, myself and some friends that I would be doing stand-up comedy at the end of the year again, because I haven't done stand-up comedy in a while. So once COVID now start getting it done, I'll be able to do that again. And um, continuing to grow my business, we have a product line coming out in a little over a year from now. So uh, those are the uh, big things. And uh, if anybody wants to know more about me, they could always just go to longshotleaders.com and find out more there. Other than longshotleaders.com, are you on social media? Give out those social media links so people can stay connected with you. Absolutely. Uh, you can always just find me at Stein Media, uh, wherever. But if you go to longshotleaders.com, you'll see all of our my social right there. You know, we do every, you got to do everything these days, right? So we're on, uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, LinkedIn, Pinterest, the whole nine, the whole shebang. You have any final thoughts before we close it out? Yeah, sure. I'll just I'll just end with this. You know, motions are only as good. Or your life is only as good as the emotions that are lived within that life. So make sure that you have 
good, positive emotions. And uh, remember, that's what comes first. Happiness comes first. Gratitude comes first. Then usually you'll find the success that you want once you've established that as a foundation. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, longshotleaders.com, Stein Media, on social media platforms. Be sure to follow, rate, review, and share after listening to this episode. Android users, go to the Google Play Store and download the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast app. Michael Stein, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream. Dream.